Well, we are just moving right along here. Um, <clears throat> as I was telling you, I was uh, finishing up the last parts of the message this afternoon. I was watching that golf game going on, and they're really, it sounded like they're trying to hype it up. I don't know if it's because it wasn't looking to be a good finish, but they were just looking at it and telling you. I mean, there were just these three or four guys that all had like three or four under, but they started playing and, and they all have different styles. The one guy, he, he, his, his backswing is so short, but he puts it out. He's like averaging like 315 yards on his drives. I couldn't touch that if I tried. If you put a rocket on the back of my driver, I, I still don't think I could swing well enough to make that happen. <laughs> but I'm sitting there and I texted Kyle and I said, man, I really want to go golfing right now. <laughs> but uh, those guys are talented. They're very good at what they do. And then the baseball game started and the race have not been doing too great. I think we've dropped like five in a row or four in a row. Yeah. But then, and Boston's coming to town uh, next week. So they're number two in the division, so we'll see. And no one cares about the Yankees. No one cares because they're just losing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. But uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on, stuff to watch on TV and things like that. But I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here because uh, I think we're going to talk about an important part of Scripture. You've heard me say many times, and you've probably heard Dr. Lindstrom say and Dr. Arnold say, uh, that divine revelation is it's it's done we we believe the bible teaches that what is completed here in the scripture is all that we need but there are many religions that they put a heavy emphasis on divine revelation uh, they encourage it in their worship services people will stand up and they will take what that person says and compare it not well excuse me not compare it but put it on the same level of inspiration that the bible claims and this passage we're going to look at in 1 Corinthians 13 as we continue our series, Growing Pains. Paul's going to make some illustrations that I hope will help you understand why when you see in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and through on to 13, why prophecies will fail. It doesn't mean that prophecies will not have any more value. But we're going to look at that word faileth. We're going to look at that phrase uh, vanish away. They're the same word. And I'm going to show you why I teach and believe that the Bible says here there's no more divine revelation. And why tongues in the way that it was back in that time, it ceased. Because the Scripture was being built. And it's important for you and I to understand that we have the completed Word of God. If we don't believe that, then we're going to have a lot of people abusing these so-called gifts and making a mockery of God. We're going to look specifically at the Book of Mormon, not today. I mean, I'm not going to pass out the Book of Mormon for you. But there are clear places in the Book of Mormon where they contradict God's Word. And I actually read the, introdu uh, the, the introduction today to the Book of Mormon and the last plea they make is, read this, ask God, and pray if it is true. The Bible doesn't make any kind of claim like that. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17 of 2 Timothy 3 says, if you apply it, you will grow in knowledge. The Book of Mormon honestly says, verify this if it is true. Well, how do we verify the Book of Mormon? By what the Bible says. And there's two places where the Book of Mormon is just so far off. Uh, it's, it's a direct um, disagreement with the Word of God. It's not even like, oh, well, that's a translation issue. Well, one says this is how you get to heaven, and the other says this is how you get to heaven, and they are, they're opposed. So it's important to understand why, as we're going through, uh, we're talking about love particularly, and we're talking about this in light of gifts, and this, this, this passage is kind of sandwiched in between the gifts of the Holy Spirit in, in 1 Corinthians 12, the unification of all of us in one body, and then uh, chapter 14, which talks a lot about prophecy and about tongues. 
Because this gift was a gift that was being used in the Corinthian church. There were people, I believe, speaking the Word of God, uh, not in any kind of way that you see today. I don't think that when these young Corinthian believers used the gift of tongues, they were not speaking in an unknown uh, angelic language. And I'm going to get into that way more next week. But they were abusing it so much so that it was like if all of us in here were to just start talking forcefully, stating our own opinion, and we're just basically shouting and screaming and trying, trying to draw attention to ourselves. This is what was happening in the Corinthian church. It's a sign of immaturity because people were not using this gift to edify the lost or to build up those who were in uh, the body of Christ already. They were using it to puff themselves up. Ooh, look at me. Look what God has given me. Look at, look at all the languages that I can speak. Look at all this divine revelation that I have. There was no order in the service. And this problem permeated many problems that were happening in, in, in the Corinthian church. They were just young, immature, carnal believers. And so when Paul gets to this part, it's important for us to understand that we're not... There, my, uh, the interpretation here is not to devalue prophecy at this time. There was, a, there was a place for that divine revelation. The Word of God was not yet completed. Now it's completed. So we don't need people to stand up in church today and shout over the teaching of the Word of God, and we then bring our attention to that person and say, what they're saying is as good as Scripture. There's no need for that anymore. We now have the completed Word. And we have to make sure that this is the completed Word of God. Study to show thyself approved in the God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And this is where so many young believers mess up. I've seen it. Young men that get saved and they're so excited. They're so passionate. But they can't get out of their own way. They, they think that they are like always discovering something new about, the, about God's word. And this is where you get crazy theology. This is how Jehovah's Witness started. Russell, I believe, was his name, was his last name. You know, he was an agnostic for a long time. And he went to a, a Bible study for Seventh-day Adventists. And then he came out of that Bible study and thought, man, I have this extra biblical gift of discernment. And he began to say things like there was an, invis there was an invisible return of Christ in the 1800s. Where is that in the Bible? It's It's not. The only return that uh, uh, the Lord is going to make is, of course, the rapture where he's going to descend with a shout, but it's very visible what's going to happen. Well, then Russell goes on to say in 1914, the visible return of Christ will happen. It's 2021. I remember going on a cruise. Do you remember this, Kyla? Those, those guys who were on the cruise? It wasn't just those guys. It was a whole family. And they had shirts and I don't know if this is what the shirt said exactly, but Kyla, do you remember they said, we're not paying for this cruise or we didn't pay for this cruise or something like that? They had a shirt on anyway that said, the Lord is coming back May 23rd, 2011. Right when we were on the cruise. And I think they mocked about how they didn't pay for this cruise because they're going to be raptured anyway. <laughs> You know who walked off the boat with us? Those same people. And I, I, I think I saw them wear the shirts. They had those shirts as they were walking out. And the day was like two days past. But you know, and you've, you've probably seen it, we've seen it uh, of, you know, many times where people claim that the return of Christ is going to happen. The Bible says we don't know the day or the hour. But when somebody gets the idea that they have more enlightenment than what the Holy Spirit has already given us through His Word problems, big problems. And so the proof text we're going to look at tonight is the text that informs us those things are, are no longer you know, applicable to today. Is there a, a gift of prophecy? Yes, I think it's still around. I do not think, though, it is as powerful as it was in the infancy of the church. Same thing with tongues. But look uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in verse 8. We, we went through last week and talked about what love is and what it is not. When you see here the word charity, it is understood as love, and that is agape love, which is the, 
the, the love that God demonstrated to us and that we are commanded to demonstrate towards others. And you have a very important three words here, charity never faileth. Now hold your place and go to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to spend just a little bit of time here in Colossians 3. When I was first uh, learning in Bible study methods how to do different types of Bible study, the book that I picked was Colossians to do the devotional method. And Colossians is a wonderful book. Wonderful applications, great biblical truths are contained within Colossians. And we see here in verses 12 through 17, this is on page 1265 in a church loan Bible, we see that we're commanded to put on the new man. That's over there in verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. This all lines up with what the Bible teaches. When you believe you are born into God's family, you have that new birth. Okay, we're commanded here in Colossians 3 to walk in that. But how do we do that? Well, specifically, look at verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, not chosen to be saved, but we are now in this predestinated uh, position because we've believed. We are the elect of God because we have believed on His Son. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. That, you, you know two words right there. It's from what we saw in 1 Corinthians 13. Charity is, it suffers long. It is kind. Okay, and we talked about long-suffering last week. A long soul. This week I've had to practice being a long soul. Being kind to people who you might think it's hard to be kind to them. We had a situation where I had to have a service guy come in here, and for some reason, he was just having a very bad day. And I mentioned one thing, and he flew off the handle at me. He didn't let me finish, because if I would have completed what I said, he would have no reason to blow up. But he did. And I'll be, I'll be straightforward with you. That angered me. I don't... <laughs> Look, we're all adults. Let's be kind to one another. Let's say kind things. And when you make a decision to be unkind to somebody, you make that decision. And that bothers me. I don't like that. But I had to suffer long with him. I had to be patient. Because I know that God is patient with me. But that has happened several times this week. And I'm sure you've been through it as well. You've had to be very patient with somebody. Well, we're told right here that the bowels of mercy and kindness and humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, this is a part of putting on the new man. Verse 14, and here's where I want to focus. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. This is a really beautiful phrase. I really want to encourage you, if you have a computer at home or if you have a cell phone, I know uh, uh, iPhones have the eSword app on their phone. Get eSword. Download the KJV Plus, is what it's called. And you can see the Strong's words the original words for each word that we have in English. That word bond is a pretty interesting word. It means a ligament, a uniting principle. So we're told here that love is the ligament. It's the thing that brings it all together as we put on the new man. See, you can't, we can't say, I'm walking in the Spirit, but you don't love. It doesn't work. It's like you have all the pieces, but they're not connected. It's like the Lego set is laid out, and you can see what it would look like if it was put together, but it's not put together. So as it says here, it's a specific kind of uni uh, unifying principle to, as it says here, perfectness. That is, completeness, maturity. So as we grow, we should love more and more and more. I'm not going to go into detail about what the world calls love, which is just turning a blind eye to sin and all of that. We've talked at length about that. But agape love, I think, the more you witness, the more you're ready to share, the stronger you become in the Lord. And I say that because of application that I have seen in other people and I've seen in my own life. When I really started to make spiritual gains... 
That's what the kids call it when they're in the gym. They're, they're getting, you know, strong and stuff. When I, when, when I started to get stronger in the Lord was when I was soul winning. Because my, my faith was challenged. I would come up to people and they would be incredibly receptive. And other times it would not be that way. But each time I learned how to share the gospel in different situations, and it drove me to the word. Well, what about this? Well, what about this? The people that were against the gospel bringing up claims. Well, what about this verse and this passage and this verse? I didn't know the answer. So that night, it would drive me to go into my Bible and see what is that passage. And the most important principle I learned is context. Boy, context is so important. It's why I believe this book is uh, inerrant because context explains it all. But people don't like to do that. You ever met somebody that cherry picks verses? And like, what? oh, you got this and you got this and you got this. And all three of them, the context, the the context is nothing near the case that they're making. Okay, you've got to guard against that. So the only way you know what verses are out of context is you have to know the context they're in properly. This is why I encourage you guys to read entire books in one sitting. Colossians is great. It's has what, four chapters? You could read that tonight. Read 1 Corinthians in one take. It will better inform you the theme of the book. That's how you learn and how you grow. But without love... You can do all the Bible study you want, but if you're not exercising that knowledge by teaching others and leading other people to Christ, and I'm not saying that every single time that you talk about the gospel, that person has to trust Christ. That's, that's not probable. But be willing to share it. Carry tracks. Be ready to have a gospel conversation. The more that you demonstrate love towards people in that way, and the more that you kind of burn off in, in, in spiritual exercise the things that you're learning, you're going to grow more. But we have seen where people just get so deep into the Word, they never come up. It's like they know so much, but they're so caught up in the terminology and in the definitions of words and in all of these different illustrations that they just get heady in that knowledge. We see that exactly in the Corinthian church. You're puffed up, knowledge puffeth up. Charity is what edifieth, okay? So as you learn and grow, that bond of perfectness is exercising what you learn. Without that, we're just kind of preaching to the choir, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? We're seeing this a lot in these conventions, right? Everyone is excited to preach against sin, and I think, amen, that's a good thing. No one is ready to go talk to a lost soul. No one. Because they haven't, they haven't practiced it. They don't know what to say. Oh, what do I say? You are in the Bible all the time, and you don't know what to say? I, I don't mean to laugh, but it's like, that's, that's a lack of practice. You know, like, think about an athlete. They can be in the gym all day, but if they don't go practice the plays, I mean, the first time they're going to be able to practice them is when they play another team. Are they going to play well? They're going to make those mistakes. Love is the way that we have that bond of perfectness. Look in verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. I think the peace of God here is our salvation. Because now we have peace with God. We're no longer an enemy. We're no longer in a position where we could be judged against His righteousness. The peace of God is found in Christ. Let that rule in your hearts to the which also you are called into one body. This is another proof why I think this is talking about you know, how we should dwell on our salvation because how are we put into that one body? By the Spirit. How do we receive the Spirit? By believing. Okay, Ephesians 1.13 and other places in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12.13 tells us that. And because of those things, how are we supposed to react? Look at the last part of the verse. And be ye thankful. The more you hear about the gospel, the more you are reminded of it, the more that you dwell on it, should drive you to a more thankful attitude towards God for that salvation. Continue in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, copiously, in an abundance. What should be dwelling in abundance? 
The Word of Christ. What is that? The Word of God. The words that Christ said. Know them. Sit in them. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This is interesting. As we grow in love, there is an application here for music in our lives. Two applications specifically. Look what it says. Teaching and admonishing. Admonishing is a gentle rebuke. Okay, I, I, I discovered that today as I was looking at these words. I always knew it was a rebuke, but an application here, the specific word that is used is a gentle rebuke. If we're not careful as we're young in the faith or we're, we're very strong in our flesh and weak in our spirit, we can find someone who they are making a mistake, they're doing something wrong, but we're so ready to inform them of their error, we burn them to a crisp. It's like we're looking around for Christians with their heads down in the mud and we're ready to just step on them a little bit more. Like, yeah, you know you're wrong. I know you're wrong. How's it feel? As we sing praises to the Lord, the things that we're singing about should teach us and they should also gently rebuke us. This is why Calvary is very protective of the songs that are, that are sung here. We're not going to let songs from Elevation Worship and all these other places that are very carnal in their Christian application, we're not going to let them. That's not the place. Does the song teach? Does it gently rebuke? Does it encourage? Well, those are things we want to look for. And it's important to understand, no, no uh, song that's in that red hymnal is inspired by God. We can draw biblical truths from it because it draws off of a biblical passage. But there's a real application to music. And so we've got to be careful what comes in these little ears of ours. Look what it says in verse 17. And whatsoever ye do, the thi our actions, whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. And we demonstrate all those things through love. Go back to 1 Corinthians 13, 8. I, I went to Colossians 3 because I think it really informs these three words. Charity never faileth. There is never going to be a time, and I use the word never because the Scripture uses the word never, there will never be a time where a response in love is inappropriate. Isn't that nice? You can know right now tonight with any kind of situation that you go through with individuals, you can choose to respond in love or you can respond without love. But there'll never be a situation where love fails. Continue on here. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. We're going to stop here for a moment because there's a claim here that is made. Prophecies, tongues, knowledge. Those things, unlike love, those things will come to an end. They will be rendered useless. Now let's do a little bit of a word study on that. The, uh, the two words here we're going to look at is they shall fail, the word fail, and then the last part there, it shall vanish away. Here's what that word means. It's uh, katageo, katageo, and it means to render entirely idle or useless. So when we see that prophecies shall fail, they're going to be rendered useless. And tongues will cease. That's a different word. That, that means to stop. And then again at the end of that, that verse, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. It's going to be rendered useless. There's a claim that's made here. Now the next couple of verses are giving us illustrations of why that's true. So let's look at what it says. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now I have heard that this means our glorified bodies. There's no way it can mean that. Maybe in application, 
But in interpretation, we're talking about these three gifts. Prophecies, divine knowledge, and tongues. They're going to come to a, er, a stop. For what reason? We know in part, we prophesy in part. The early church knew what they knew based on what was being revealed to them through this gift of prophecy. Okay, So as the Scripture was being completed and it was done in Revelation 22, it's all now completed. There's no more knowing in part. We know it all. We've got it all. So continue on here as it says in verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. As we grow, as a child grows, they should be growing into adulthood. Age and experience makes them able to be an adult. The things I know now in my age, I didn't know when I was 10 years old or 5 years old. But as I've learned, I don't go back to act and acting like the 5-year-old without knowledge or the 10-year-old without knowledge or even the version of myself last year. I know more than I did at that time. But we're not going to go back to those childhood illustrations, those things that were there for me in place, those illustrations, those experiences that were there to help me grow. I'm not now at 30 years old going to go back to those things and dwell on those things. That's for when I was a child. I'm an adult now. I have a more complete wealth of knowledge to, to pull from. Your Bible is completed. There's nothing that needs to be added to it. That's not a claim that I'm making. The Scripture's making that claim. And the Word was being completed at this time. Let me, let me just talk about one thing here. The gift of prophecy present in the Corinthian church to give a new revelation while the Bible was still incomplete would be rendered entirely useless upon the completion of Scripture. And it has been. But look at this heretical new revelation that we get from the Mormon church. And this is not to attack Mormons. If, if anything, if there's a Mormon listening, I want you to look at what the Bible says about where you are. The Book of Mormon claimed to be delivered via a resurrected being named Moroni. There were 12 of these different beings. This specific one talked to the prophet Joseph Smith. The book contradicts the Bible. And I'm going to give you chapter and verse of the Bible and chapter and verse of the Book of Mormon, where they disagree totally. And this is all under the guise of, I, Joseph Smith, have received new revelation from God. Okay, Joseph, let's hear what you have to say. And we need to compare it to the completed Word of God. Sure, we can say that's false, because the Bible says it's false, but there are specifics within the Book of Mormon that, sh that, that show you that. You might want to write this down. Because it may come in handy when you're sharing the gospel with a Mormon. Don't like throw this to them right away, okay? Because people do that to us too, and it can be a big turnoff. Let me tell you the story. I remember using these two passages when uh, a lady who used to come to our church, she had somebody knock on her door who was a Mormon. And she said, I don't have time right now, but let me schedule a time when I can have our youth director with us because it was a young lady. And I came over the next time and we talked for about 50 minutes, almost an hour. And we were going back and forth, and I was setting up to get to this very point because I wanted her to tell me, I believe the Book of Mormon is on the same level of divine inspiration as the Holy Bible. And I was interested in that claim because I knew these two verses existed. I kid you not, I'm not one for the supernatural heebie-jeebie stuff, but what I saw when I brought up these verses was nothing short of a demonic possession of this young woman. I brought up these two points. I said, your text says this. The Bible says this. They're not the same. They're both talking about salvation, but they're not the same. What do I do about this? It had to be 30 seconds. She said nothing. She's looking at me and she looked right past me. Do you know what I mean? Like when someone's like zoning out. There's a heaviness in the room. I remember feeling it and I was like, something is wrong here. 
It was like she was not present. She got up after that 30-second delay and just walked right out of the house. Didn't respond to me, didn't say anything to me. She's pretty deep in the Mormon faith, and there was an opportunity for her to hear the truth. She did hear the truth, and there was an attack for her not to believe it. I believe the devil's doing that in people. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to, uh, hid to them that are lost. The God of this world, little g God, is blinding the minds of them that will believe. The deeper people get into a false doctrine, the deeper their deception is. Some of you may have experienced that. The way that you thought the Bible was to be interpreted, the religion that you thought was of the way, the truth, and the life before you came to Christ. It can be very, very difficult for people to get saved. But here's what I brought up to her. The Book of Mormon contradicts the Bible. In 2 Nephi 10.24, and Nephi is spelled N-E-P-H-I, 2 Nephi 10.24 and 2 Nephi 25.23. I don't have the page number. <laughs> I didn't do that much research on it. But 2 Nephi 10.24 and 2 Nephi 25-23 specifically make these two claims. They say that salvation is one, a self-reconciliation to God. Does anybody know where the Bible says differently about that? Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 18. 2 Corinthians 5.18. Nephi says salvation is a self-reconciliation. We reconcile ourselves out of good works. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.18, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. God is the one which removed that which was in the way. Okay. The second claim that is made in 2 Nephi here is that salvation is attainable, quote, after all we can do. We're sa it says this in 2 Nephi uh, 25-23. It says we're saved by grace, not of works, after all that we can do. That's a direct contradiction within itself. But now we know from where in the Bible do we have else? Uh, do we have the Bible saying, the opposite. For by grace are you saved, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. After all we can do? No. We're saved by grace. The Mormon religion teaches something different. This is a religion that has captured an entire group of people. You would be deceiving yourself if you were to say, well, it's not that big of a deal. It is that big of a deal. And it could be squashed like a bug, if we understand what this verse is saying. There is no extra biblical revelation outside of the Bible. That's it. This is enough. This is plenty. We have the Old Testament as an example, and there's many prophetic elements in the Old Testament, and we have the New Testament as the new covenant. That's it. There's not a third covenant that needs to be written. This will never pass away. Heaven and earth may pass away, but the Word of God never will pass away. So go back to 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to wrap up here. I know it's a little bit shorter than normal, but sometimes you say all you have to say. <laughs> Here's what it says here in verse 11. When I was as a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. That the completion of God's Word, we put away those gifts that were used in the infancy of the church, to push forward the Word of God. Verse 12, we have another illustration. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. Paul is saying here, the things that I'm telling you, I know them in part as they are revealed to me. We can compare that with 2 Timothy 3.16 about that phrase, the inspiration of God. God breathed. Theonoustos, okay? He spoke through 
the writers in their own personal writing styles. And what we have today is the Word of God completed. When Paul passed away and he entered into glory, knows it all. He knows it all now. When, those, when, when, when the saints in our lives, fellow believers, passed away, no more guessing. They know it all. But as we're here on the earth, we have the completed Word of God, and we're learning as we go. But there are clear doctrines that are taught throughout the Scripture that we can build off of, like salvation, like the rapture, which we're going to talk about next week. And I know next week is the 4th of July. We won't have a 4th of July themed message. We'll have a... a, a I'm really excited about it. I could start preaching on it right now. Like I've been preparing for it for several weeks, and it's just so exciting to see what is, is, is down the line. But we have prophetic teachings that we know are true because they're taught in the Bible. Baby Christians, young Christians, they need the signs. They need more of an illustration. I was reading Dehan, M.R. Dehan, on this topic. I don't agree with everything that M.R. Dehan teaches, but he had a really good insight on this passage. But he, he, he had a great illustration. I may have mentioned this last week, so forgive me if you've heard this already. But imagine your child. You tell your child, I'm going to get you a motorized scooter for Christmas. And you tell them now. And there's a, a significant time between now and Christmas. And they are so excited. They believe you. But then they say, can you give it to me in writing? Because I'd like to have a legal contract of your claim that you're going to get me this motor scooter. You'd be hurt. Because it's not enough for the child to believe your word. They need more and they need more. And then let's say you provide the, the written testament that you're going to buy them the motor scooter. And they want more. They want to see the money set aside. Are they really able to take you at your word? You'd think there's some trust issues there. Look, we can just simply take God at His word. And the rest of it will fill in as we obey. And we practice. And we continue to exercise our learning in the word. It's amazing to me people that really dedicate time to memorize God's word. I've seen people memorize the entire books of uh, the the entire book of Hebrews. That's impressive. That's a good way to spend your time memorizing large portions of scripture. Can be a great encouragement. Unfortunately, some of the people that I've seen memorize Hebrews, they don't know how to win a soul to Christ. <laughs> we can do things in 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 excess to where it, it's it's not good. You know, going out there and sharing the gospel all the time is a good thing. We also need to be praying. We need to be, we, we, we need to love the Lord. We need to be active in a church. We need to use our spiritual gifts. By the way, I was talking to Dr. Myers about spiritual gifts, and he, he had a great insight that I want to share with you. He thinks that everybody has the gift of helps. Everybody can come alongside a local church and help. It can be turning down the ACs, filling the, the, the track racks, gathering up prayers for people, just helping in some way. That's, we can all do that, but oftentimes people don't want to do that because in their immaturity, they want to be seen, right? They want to have all the praise on themselves. Those are you know, hallmarks of a young Christian that's still struggling with, with pride and the flesh and those things, they should work themselves out as we continue to do what's important. We're going to close on, on verse 13 here. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity. Faith is believing specifically here, believing the Word of God. Hope, great word. We're going to learn about this on Sunday. El peace is the word. And it's not, I hope the lightning win on Monday night, which I do. But you know what I'm saying in that statement? I don't know if they're going to win. I have no clue. Now, there's... Uh, sports people out there that want me to put money down, you know, and they're like, oh, we know. It's a lock, right? That's, I still don't know if the Lightning are going to win tomorrow night. I don't know what's going to happen at the end of this service. I, I don't know. I hope it's a good thing. That's not what this word means. It's a joyful anticipation. 
That is a direct translation of what that word means. We're not twisting that word to fit our belief. That's what the word el peace means. So we have believing, we have a joyful anticipation, and we have charity. These three things are very important actions and beliefs in the life of a believer. What's the most important, though, the verse says? But the greatest of these is charity. And we have a beautiful demonstration of that love in Jesus Christ. This is how you can be that person in someone's life that makes a great impact. I I, want to be that kind of person in an individual's life. I want them to be like, I am thankful that somebody took the time to share the gospel with me. Are you thankful for the person who brought you to the Lord? I, I, I've told you this a couple of times. I've been listening to a lot of Dr. Hank Lindstrom over the past couple of weeks in preparation for this prophecy class because I think he was extremely gifted in that area. I got that joke this morning from one of his sermons. He told that joke in about a minute and 25 seconds. It took me like 20 minutes to write. I said that joke word for word. (laughs) I transcribed it. I did not want to mess up or put it in my own words because the way he delivered it was just choice. But then he went on to teach. And specifically in, in that lesson, he was teaching on the rich young ruler. And you know what? I don't remember what Dr. Hank Lindstrom taught about the rich young ruler. But I know what I believe about that passage, and it lines up with what he was revealed. It's not because of some miraculous thing that we came to the same conclusion. It's the application of biblical principles. That's a comfort to me. I'm not very experienced, but I can come to the same conclusions because this word is consistent. It's a special book in that way. Moroni had nothing to do with this. Moroni baloney, right? Now that was probably offensive, but it it is true. (laughs) This is from the Lord Himself. We ought to know it, but it's completed. Rest assured in that. You don't need to go to some guru to tell you some special thing. You can just read God's Word and ask Him to help you. Have you done that? Before you study your Bible, ask the Lord to open your eyes. Ask Him that. Reveal to me what I need to see in this. I was talking to a friend the other day. He's taken our Galatians course. He knows Galatians 1.8. But he said, today I saw something totally different in that verse. Not a different interpretation, but a different application. In a way that that verse speaks to him. Not that there's like some special thing there, but whatever he's going through in his life, that verse met the need. It was specifically about what the gospel is and what the gospel is not. I believe it was in in Galatians 1.6. I've had many moments like that. There's a passage that I know, I I see it all the time. You think you know everything about it, but there's always a fresh way to apply it. Not a new interpretation, but many applications. So next week, Lord willing, we'll go through 1 Corinthians 14, where we get into how, how the abuse of these gifts were happening specifically. And we'll get into what that means and what the church should look like in the order of the service. But let's look up here. This hand represents you and me. My wallet represents sin. I'm going to put this on top of my hand because we've all sinned. God, He loves us, but He hates this sin because this sin separates us from Him. In order to get to heaven, we have to be just like God, perfect, without any sin. But we're not. We've all fallen short. We all have sin. The wages of sin is death, an eternal separation from God forever in a literal fire-burning hell. You want to talk about extra revelation? Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't believe in a literal fire-burning hell. That's how they open up to you. Have you ever had a conversation with Jehovah's Witnesses at your door? If you give them time, they get to that point. How would a loving God send His children to burn in hell? A lot of mistakes there. Not everybody's a child of God. And God does not have to be unjust to also be loving. And the Bible says it's a literal fire burning hell. And those are three right off the bat. Well, divine revelation of Russell says something different. You need to be careful with that. 
Mark it and avoid it because it's outside of what the Bible says clearly on those issues. But the Bible says it's not a turning over a new leaf or changing your sin into the appearance of something else. Good works cannot save you. A death payment is required. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He was fully God, fully man, the only begotten Son of God. 2,000 years ago, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that's Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That verse teaches that the moment a sinner puts their trust in Jesus Christ, who has already paid for their sins, was buried and rose again, they receive as a gift eternal life, and they will never perish. John 5, 24, Jesus goes even further and says they'll never be brought into condemnation because they're passed from death unto life. <laughs> That's all the revelation we need. All of the different religions out there, they have a text outside of the Bible. And if you have time, it would be beneficial for you to read those texts because you would be able to see the Bible teaches differently. It just proves this word more and more. But how does a person have assurance of heaven? They believe on Jesus Christ. That sin has been paid. The Bible speaks uh, in very plain terms. It is removed as far as the east is from the west. You can go to the North Pole. You can go to the South Pole. You can't go to the East Pole or the West Pole. That sin will never be brought up against you again. Amen? That's a good thing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed if you're watching tonight and you have yet to put your trust in Jesus Christ. I encourage you to do so right where you're sitting on this live stream. You can simply make the decision that you will believe that Jesus Christ, who was God's Son, paid for all of your sins, past, present, and future on His uh, on the cross, His death, burial, and resurrection. You believe, you receive that free gift of everlasting life. If you're watching on Facebook or maybe on our website, you can click the button that says, Yes, I will trust Christ. If you're watching on Sermon Audio, you can send us an email, info at calvarytampa.org, and that lets us know that someone trusted Christ. That's a great encouragement. This is not a time-sensitive message either. Just make sure you do it before you die. Because if you die without Him, you're going to remain without Him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank You for 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. Thank You for the instruction that love will never fail. We thank You for the gifts in the early church that brought us this Word. But now we thank You, Lord, for Your completed Word. And I pray that we can learn it, study it, and be able to share it with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's episode of Bible Line, make sure to subscribe to the channel and share this video with a friend. Do you have a Bible question? Send us an email, questions at BibleLineMinistries.org, and we'll do our best to get you an answer. Or you can leave your question in the comments of this video. Be sure to check the links in the description for more clear Bible teaching. Bible Line is a ministry of Calvary Community Church located in Tampa, Florida.